Good morning, everyone. Great to see all of you. I would like for us to look at Matthew chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. We'll be reading the verse 8. Matthew chapter 12, beginning with verse 1 to verse 8. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here, and if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Amen. I've taken the final phrase of this portion and call today's sermon, the Lord of the Sabbath, the Lord of the Sabbath. We hear this word often, Sabbath or Sabbath day, how we are to keep it. It used to be very legalistic. Some time ago, not too long ago, people were at home unable to do anything because they misunderstood what Sabbath was. They thought that it was supposed to be a day of holy living. And so they had to refrain from all sorts of worldly things, watching movies, going out to eat, you name it. You weren't able to put gas. You weren't able to do much. And that was not very long ago. We have come now to learn what truly what Sabbath means. And so we have this brand new faith, if we will. And so we have been liberated, but this is something that is very important. And in our ongoing study of the book of Matthew, this is a turning point because this is when the Pharisees decide to kill Jesus because of this violation, because to the Jews, keeping the Sabbath was everything. And so when Jesus claimed himself to be the Lord of the Sabbath, well, this was the last straw. And so they began plotting to kill him. We have seen in the previous chapters the rejection of doubt, rejection and criticism, indifference, blasphemy. There are some people that have accepted Jesus, but for the most part, Matthew gives us up to this point all kinds of negative reactions. Indifference is one of the biggest. Oh, I don't care about what Jesus does. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. That was one of the rejections. That was one of the attitudes and responses. They criticized, they doubted him, and even blasphemed him. We want to talk about three things today. First, this portion of scripture is divided nicely into three sections. One, first is the incident. Second is indictment. And third, instruction. First, the incident. Look at verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. The word Sabbath means to cease, to stop, to cease. A complete cessation. Not a partial cessation, but a complete one. A stopping of something. That's what Sabbath means. And when you have two letters back to back, such as B, it just adds to the emphasis. It is a complete stopping of doing something. It day that they stopped doing what they did on the other days. It was a day that you stopped doing what you did on the other days. Exodus chapter 20, we are told to take the seventh day and keep it holy. Sabbath is seventh day. And that was the day that God told Israelites to keep it holy, to keep it separated. And so seventh day, even today we have people who are called seventh day Adventists and they keep the seventh day, which is Saturday to us. So to us, Saturday is Sabbath. Sunday is not the Sabbath. And we will explain that momentarily. 
This is the only commandment that is ceremonial. Ceremonial. It is non-moral. In the Ten Commandments, all other nine are moral absolutes that apply not only then, but it still applies today. They are moral absolutes. Thou shalt not kill or murder. Thou shalt not have adultery, so on and so forth. Thou shalt not lie, steal, covet. These are moral absolutes that do not change just because of time. Nowhere in the New Testament, however, this keeping of the Sabbath is repeated because it is not a moral absolute. It is not a law. It was a ceremonial command. When coming to the New Testament, every other command is repeated except this one. Take a look at it. Take a look at your New Testament to see if this commandment is repeated, is commanded by either the Lord or the writers of the New Testament to say, keep the Sabbath holy. At the time of Jesus, the Sabbath was still the ceremonial law of God. But the Pharisees added so, so many things. They would be in violation of something no matter what you did. Instead of being a day of rest, it was a day of incredible burden. That's why last Sunday we talked about Jesus saying, I invite you to come and have rest. And what glorious refreshing thing that must have been coming from the mouth of the Lord saying, all you who are heavy laden and burdened, if you come to me, I will give you rest. They were so, so burdened with so many things that these Pharisees have put on their shoulders. It was more difficult to rest than it was to work the other six days. A day of rest. It was more of work to try to rest than the other days when you were supposed to work. In one of the sections of Talmud, there are 24 chapters listing all the Sabbath laws. There are two sections, but in the one section contain 24 chapters and lists all the Sabbath laws. And this is just a small sample. One rabbi, for instance, spent two and a half years trying to understand one of these chapters. And so if you do your math, you could spend your entire life and not understand the meaning of all the laws. For instance, you couldn't travel more than 3,000 feet away from your home, but on Friday, just before the Sabbath, if you were to go beyond 3,000 or at the point of 3,000 feet after your house, if you put your, some kind of food there, a meal, something for you to eat, and so when you go 3,000 feet on the Sabbath, Technically, because you have your food there, that is designated to be an extension of your home. So you can then go additional 3,000 feet after that 3,000 feet mark. This is ludicrous. Just because you have planted some food there, that means that you are allowed to go additional 3,000 and on again and again. And if you were walking on a road that's close to your house, but it is not your house, you can technically put like a rope and make that your gate so then you can move on. It was just a terrible thing, but they kept, they tried to keep the Sabbath holy. They were worshipers of God. They thought they were worshiping God. They got this all wrong. No wonder when Jesus came, he told them, you vipers, you hypocrites. If you threw an object in the air, with one hand, you can catch with the same hand, but not the other, because that's considered work. Can you understand the logic behind this? I can't. You must catch with the same hand. If you were about to eat your food and the Sabbath hits, you have to drop your food right there. You couldn't finish bringing it to your mouth. You would have to drop it. That's how serious they took it. A tailor couldn't carry a needle because he might sew. A scribe couldn't carry his pen because he might write. A student couldn't carry his book because he might read. You couldn't examine anyone's clothing because you might find an insect there and kill it. No fire could be lit. You could pour your cold water on warm but not warm on cold. An egg could not be boiled even by laying it in the sun in the sand, which was usual in those days. You couldn't take a bath for fear it would spill on the floor and wash the floor. 
that if the water would spill out of your body and would go onto the floor, you might be tempted to wipe it and clean. That would be considered work, a violation to the Sabbath. A woman couldn't look in a glass or mirror because she might see a gray hair and pluck it out. When a man was ill, you can stop him from dying, but you cannot help him to get any better. You can help him so that he will not die, but you cannot make him get better. And how do you know if one is dying? You have to assume that when someone is gravely ill, you have to go to that person and try to examine and to figure out, oh, this person seems to be okay. He'll live. So you don't help him out. You couldn't put a bandage on it. You can put a bandage on a wound, but you couldn't put any medication on it. Sabbath was the focus of everything to these religious leaders. It was everything to them. And that's why this ultimately caused Jesus to die. This was what happened to Jesus because he claimed that he was the Lord of the Sabbath. So when Jesus paid absolutely no attention to the Sabbath, it infuriated the religious leaders. And so when we look at verse 14 of chapter 12 of Matthew, we are told there the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. In today's incident, Jesus and his disciples were walking through the grain fields. First of all, the problem is already there. They walked, traveled more than 3,000 feet. Traveling through probably wheat and barley fields, possibly corn fields, but it was a field that was, God has given a beautiful provision that when travelers were traveling through, they didn't have roads back then. They had these grain fields that you just went right marched in between. And if you are hungry, you are allowed to eat whatever that was there. In Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 25, we have this provision. If you go into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the ears with your hand, but you shall not put a sickle or farming tool with a blade to your neighbor's standing grain. You cannot, you couldn't cut it you couldn't do farming. You couldn't really, that's called harvesting. You couldn't do work, but you were allowed to pick and, you know, you get rid of the things, you blow it and you eat what's inside. You can eat the grain. So the disciples began to pluck the ears of grain and to eat, which was not in violation. Luke expands picking. They were picking, eating, rubbing them in their hands, separating chaff and blow them away, and therefore you eat the inside. So that was the incident. Jesus and his disciples were not in violation, and yet the indictment comes in verse 2. Verse 2 says, But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And so we'll not spend much time on that, but we'll go right into the third point, which is instruction. Jesus is being a little bit sarcastic here he says in verse 3 he said to them have you not read what david did have you not read aren't you teachers of the law aren't you religious leaders haven't you read haven't you read what david did when he was hungry and those who were with him how he entered the house of god verse 4 and the bread ate the bread of the presence which was not lawful for him to eat nor for those who were with him but only for the priests we have this story in first samuel 21 you can read about it how david was fleeting and he had been rejected as king by his people and so he was running south and he came to a land knob just north of Jerusalem, where the tabernacle was. And he went into this tabernacle, and the priest there, he talked to him, saying, I am very hungry from the mission. I am very hungry, and my disciples are hungry as well. My men are hungry. And so what did the priest do? He gave David and his men showbread. Showbread 
was one that was made every week. They baked 12 loaves of bread, one representing each tribe. 12 big loaves of bread were baked. Every Sabbath, the loaves would be taken away and new loaves would replace them. And those that were being replaced were allowed by the priests and priests alone were supposed to eat. But the bread that were supposed to be eaten by the priest, David the king and his men were allowed to eat. The word showbread literally means the bread of presence or continual bread. It was supposed to be a continual bread representation of God's perpetual relationship to his people. It was sacred. It was not even for David. And yet David was allowed to eat. Why was that? David ate the showbread which was not lawful for him to eat. This would be like in the Catholic Church, just because you are hungry or that is thirsty, you go inside the chapel or church or cathedral and drink all the holy water. It's just a blasphemous action, and yet the Bible says that David was allowed to eat what was only lawful for the priest to eat. He asks in verse 5, have you not read, again, in the law, how on the Sabbath the priest in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless. Here we have Mark adding to the Sabbath that was made for man. Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for man. 1 Corinthians 7, in fact, says, If you have an unbelieving partner, a husband or a wife, and they want to leave that relationship, we are told that, you can allow that person to go. You know from scripture that the only lawful, legitimate reason for a divorce, divorce period is not God's will. But God did make a provision saying under adulterous situation, you may have a divorce. But here, it is not an adulterous situation. If an unbelieving spouse wants to leave that relationship, there is a provision saying, go ahead and let that person go. Why? Because God wants to have that person, not for the rest of his or her life, go through a burden. God will do away with his ceremonial law just so that he can show his compassion and his love. If you don't believe it, just ask yourself this simple question. Why haven't you died? Why hasn't God taken your life away? If you sin, you were surely put to death. Committed adultery of all sorts. You committed murder of all sorts. You have committed in violation to God's law. And yet God is so compassionate. Even though his law says if you disobey your dad or mom or parents, you would be surely put to death. We are not dead. We are all here. Why? It is because God wants to show his love to his people. We might think that Christianity is this harsh religion where God, especially God of the Old Testament, is not God of love. Absolutely not true. Jesus, God, God the Father, the Holy Trinity, God, God is the same yesterday, today, and always. He showed love then, He shows love now. He is the same. The salvation message is the same. Anyone who would come to Him in no way, He will say, disappear from me. I never just go away from me. No, he will in no way say that. He will accept anyone who would come to him for salvation. Verse 5 says, have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? What does this mean? The priests worked on the Sabbath. They were told to work. They had to kill animals. They had to do sacrifices. They had to light fires. They were working. They were not in violation. And so verse 5 tells us that they were not guiltless. Right? They were profane the Sabbath. I work on the Sabbath, if you want to call it that. Sunday is the busiest day of my week. I work. I prepare. I do a lot of work. And I wouldn't say that people would say of me, you are in violation. You should not be working. Well, then who's going to preach? Who's going to be doing the work of God? 
the priests in the Old Testament were told to work on the Sabbath. Verse 6, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. God dwelt in the temple. To them, temple was a very sacred thing. The tabernacle, the temple in the Old Testament, God's presence was there. If David could eat the showbread and the priests can profane the Sabbath, I am greater than these, Jesus is saying. John 1, verse 14, the book of John, chapter 1, verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This verse literally says that Jesus became a tabernacle. That is, Jesus tabernacled among us. He is our Lord. He tabernacled, He templed. He is right here in our hearts. The Word became flesh. He tabernacled among us. And that's what Jesus is saying. Sabbath was a sign, a symbol, a picture of what was to come. Once the Sabbath was fulfilled, and Jesus did fulfill it, because he fulfilled it, all the signs and symbols and all the rituals and ceremonial things have put away. That is why in the New Testament we see nowhere this command or commandment repeated. He wanted mercy, verse 7. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, verse 7 tells us. You would not have condemned the guiltless. If you knew what God really wanted, he who does not want mercy but, and not ritual, he wants mercy. He does not want ceremonial rituals. System. That was only a shadow. Again, people think Christianity is very rigid and hard, but it is about serving and showing mercy and kindness and goodness. Sabbath was for meeting needs, serving God and showing mercy. Sabbath was made for man, not the other way around. And verse 8, for the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is saying, I started this. I started the Sabbath, I will interpret it. You don't interpret the Sabbath because I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Do you know why we don't keep the Sabbath anymore? Because Jesus has already fulfilled it. He fulfilled it. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 3. If you can look at that, do we have that on screen? Hebrews 4, 3, For we who have believed enter that rest, as he had said, as I swore in my wrath. They shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. In Jesus Christ, we who believe have entered rest. That is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. We already have entered this rest. What one chapter previous, Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. Well, we have come to Jesus. We have rest. We do not have the burden any longer of keeping all the rules and rituals, ceremonies and regulations. That was for a time. That was a shadow. Once the reality, once the real thing comes, you do not need a shadow. You do not need a signpost. You know, when you're driving, you have your GPS, and you look at it, and especially when you're going somewhere you don't know, and you are unfamiliar with that territory, and you listen to that turn right in quarter mile, you go this way, that way. But once you get there and you realize, hey, I know where I am now, what do you do? You don't wait until you get to that destination. You turn it off. I know I do. I turn it off immediately because it's noisy and annoying. These signs, symbols, were only pointing to what was to come. And when Jesus came and fulfilled it, we no longer are in bondage or in need or in requirement to keeping these things. In fact, these Pharisees have made so many rules that, again, people were finding it harder to rest on the Sabbath than when they were working on the other days. The Pharisees ruined it. 
Sabbath was a figure, a picture, a shadow. This is how it's going to be. It was a preview. But the Pharisees ruined it. And when Jews thought of the Sabbath, they didn't look like, oh yeah, great day of perfect rest is coming. No, it was so much a burden to them. Is Christianity a burden to you? Is coming to worship, is worshiping and praising, praying, listening to His Word, are these things a burden to you? It ought not to be. It ought to be an extension of the gratitude of our hearts, even giving an offering to God, saying, You are the Lord, even over my finances. I am giving you my all to you. It ought to come as a result of our gratitude in our hearts. Singing praise to Him ought not to be a burden. Meeting together regularly ought not to be a burden. You want burden? Go back to the Old Testament days and try to keep the Sabbath. Jesus says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. The shadow is gone. Jesus rose on the first day of the week. The disciples met together on the first day of the week, Acts 2, 1. They broke bread on the first day of the week, Acts 27. They were to collect offerings on the first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16, 1. Why are we not keeping the Sabbath, that is, keeping the Lord's Day on the Saturday? Why do we celebrate Jesus on Sunday? Because that was the day that commemorated and celebrated the resurrection. We celebrate the resurrection, even the calendars we have today, A.D., we have that very first day, the first day, blessed day of the resurrection of Jesus, marking the very first day, first day. Sunday is not the end of the weekend. Weekend does not begin on Friday and then ends on Sunday. It actually starts the beginning of the week. We need to reprogram our thinking. Sunday is the first day, offering our first day to the Lord and early 9.30 at that, worshiping God, giving God, dedicating God, being consumed with wanting to please the Lord. We come together early, gather on Sunday, the first day of the week. We're not doing it, oh, you know, it's the final day of the weekend before going to work on Monday, which is the first day. Reprogram your thinking, brothers and sisters. Sunday to Christians is the most sacred day. Even though every day belongs to the Lord, Sunday, the first day of the week, the first century Christians not only met together on the first day of the week, not only broke bread on the first day of the week, not only collected offerings on the first day of the week, Jesus, after his resurrection, appeared to his disciples on numerous occasions on the first day of the week. When John went to the island of Patmos in the book of Revelation to receive all kinds of holy things, that was the first day of the week. First day of the week is when we Christians, Protestant Christians, celebrate the resurrection. We come in remembrance of that blessed resurrection, for without it, we would be the most pitiful beings on earth. If there was no resurrection, we are wasting our time. But because Jesus rose again, we too celebrate and commemorate that day, the resurrection day. The Sabbath is done away because Jesus has fulfilled it, because he is the Lord of it. That's why we meet today, the resurrection day. This is the new covenant. The old is gone. Behold, the new has come. We are new creatures in Christ. We are new covenantal people. Jesus says, come to me, which we have. I will give you rest, which we already have. We have eternal rest. And we are celebrating it every single Sunday. That is why no matter where we live, no matter where we are, Saturday night, but come Sunday morning, we make ourselves to come into the presence of his place, his place, this place called Cross Point Chapel. And we do our very best not to miss it. So if you want to be technically legalistic about it, refrain from your parties on Sunday, gatherings on Sunday. Refrain from making appointments, traveling, no matter what. I don't want to be too dogmatic. If there is a funeral, obviously that takes precedence. 
If you have some important engagement in the family, obviously that should take priority. However, do your very best to making it to the house of God every Sunday because this is holy. This is our version of keeping the Sabbath day holy. Every day belongs to God, but the first day of the week is very special. We need to start on the right foot. Start your first day on the right foot. Then the rest of your week will go smooth. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. The Lord of the Sabbath, he fulfilled it. May you continue to celebrate his beautiful, risen day, Sunday, every Sunday. Let's pray.